That's funny, Dad. Someone's in our secret path. This way. You'll slip. I won't fall. Maybe I will. That's okay. Cause we all fall. That's fun, Dad. Let's go down this big old hill. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to episode 22 (laughs) of the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast. I'm Christine. And I'm Sam. And we just wanted to um, start the podcast with a little bit of joy, which is that four-year-old boy snowboarding with his dad. If you have not seen this video yet, I highly recommend it. Just go to YouTube and search Stuckasaurus. Stuckasaurus. It is the most brilliant example of just a purely joyful child in stream of consciousness mode just right. talking to himself as he's snowboarding down this hill and his parents happened to mic him um because they realized he was talking to himself <laughs> and they wanted to hear what was going on and it's just beautiful it's so it's so pure it just i mean it just i think it just kind of amplifies All the things that are kind of drummed out of us as we grow as adults. Absolutely. You know, it's like our creative side and our compassionate side. And so many things are just kind of pushed out of us as we go through life, through the educational process and all that other stuff. To make us more self-conscious about being the things that this kid is as he's going down this hill. Yeah, and yeah. it is. It's it's just so beautiful. Yeah, it's a good reminder to just uh, keep in touch with that little inner kid that everybody has. I honestly had this on a loop in my office today. I really did. I must have listened to it easily twenty times. I believe just it on a loop. I believe it. I, I, and it. And 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 I'm a stuckosaurus. Made I'm me chuckle every single time. And yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Sam listened to this this morning as she was waking up. I was already <laughs> awake and I was doing my Italian lessons online and I heard her alarm go off. And then shortly after her alarm went off, and, and I'm talking like 5.30 this morning, I hear this little boy's voice coming <laughs> coming out of the bedroom. I'm like, she's listening to Stuckasaurus again <laughs> and giggling to herself. It was really funny. Well, how could you not want to start a day with a giggle, like just yeah. with something that makes you just so purely happy you know just the fact that this little little guy exists is a reason to be happy you know i know his video has like a gazillion hits because people are like so fascinated by his sense of wonder yeah you know yeah and that it comes out so clearly in his in his personal dialogue yeah it's just it's fabulous I might fall, but that's okay because okay, we, we all, all fall. fall. <laughs> it's so simple. It's so simple and just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. So welcome back. Uh, we are in, I think, our third episode of our cookbook challenge. Third or fourth? Third? I've lost track. I think third or fourth. If you're keeping track at home, let us know. <laughs> I think... <laughs> It's either our third or fourth episode of well, our no, cookbook Wait, let's challenge. think about this. Uh, no, we, we won't we think won't about think it. About I'm it. not thinking about it. Okay. Enough thinking. All right. So this week, we made a recipe out of um, wonderful Issa Chandra Moskowitz. Ooh, I had, I had a hard time with that. Her wonderful cookbook called Vegan with a Vengeance. This is like my favorite vegan yeah, cookbook. This is a great cookbook. I just love it. This is one of those cookbooks that I went through with post-it notes and um, just about every other page. Yeah, listen. <laughs> that is the sound of multitudinous, <laughs> like, notes posted in, like, every other page of this cookbook. So um, this uh, this week's cookbook challenge recipe from Isa Chandra Moskowitz was chickpea and rice soup 
with a little bit of kale. Yes. (laughs) I love that that's what the recipe's called, with a little bit of kale. Yes. Because it's very uh, explanatory. It It is is indeed uh, chickpea and rice soup with a little bit of kale. Yes, it absolutely is. And um, first of all, I was really thrilled um, when Christine made this because, one, I love soup. It's one of my favorite things about winter is just that it is soup weather. It is. Yeah, I absolutely love it. So, um, And I'd been requesting a like a potato leek soup for a while. Yeah. Um, It's one of my favorite soups and we've never made it from scratch. Yeah. Um, So I thought that would be really cool. And the thing is, this absolutely beautiful chickpea and rice soup with a little bit of kale um, had that kind of texture to it. Yeah. Beautifully creamy, smooth potato leek texture. And because there were green onions in the soup, yeah. it actually had a bit of that flavor profile as well. So it definitely scratched that itch. Yeah, I agree. Um, I actually wrote down when I while I was cooking this soup, this is a chowder. <laughs> yeah. It's not a soup. It's a chowder um, because it's got that thick, rich kind of um, you almost have to keep watering it down kind of thing mm-hmm. going on. If you want it to be a soup, because it's just, it's so thick and rich. I mean, you would never know that this is a vegan soup. No. It's so creamy and full of flavor that, I mean, I could riff on this recipe till, the, ca- till the cows come home. Any number of ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is definitely a, a great kind of base recipe for any kind of cream based soup. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been a long time since I've made a soup that had rice in it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of comforting to have a soup with rice oh, in it. Oh, I loved that. Yeah. Absolutely. Kind of that. reminded me of like a barley kind of soup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. No, this was a beautiful recipe. It was so flavorful and rich and creamy and loads of vegetables. Just it was it was delightful. Yeah. So you make a cashew cream. With this soup, um, which, hey, gave me an opportunity again, once again, to use the Vitamix, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> which I enjoyed. Um, if you've never made a cashew cream, it's super easy. Just get yourself some raw cashews, soak them in some hot water for a couple of hours, as long as you can, really. soak. The longer you soak them, the creamier it'll come out. Um, and then in this recipe, it was just the uh, soaked raw cashews. And I think it was a cup cup of water or half a cup of water. I don't even remember. I have the recipe in front of me, but I'm not going to tell you. Go out and buy the book. (laughs) And then you just you just blend it till it's creamy, and then you set that aside. And then as you when you get towards the end of cooking this soup, you add in that cashew cream, and that's what gives it that kind of chowdery, creamy soup feel. So good, so good. Yeah, yeah. Very very satisfying. So a big thumbs up for this recipe. Two thumbs up. Absolutely. Two cucumbers up <laughs> <laughs> for this uh, Isa Chandra Moskowitz recipe. Yes. And like I said, I'll say it again and I'll say it before. Wait a minute. That was backwards. It I was. said it before and I'll say it again. If you don't have Vegan with a Vengeance, run out and buy it. Yeah. It is a fantastic cookbook. It is. And Isa Chandra Moskowitz is a vegan goddess. Yes, she is. Yes. If you don't have at least one of her books yeah. on your cookbook shelf, what are you even doing with your life? <laughs> okay, no need to be judgy about <laughs> I'm it. I'm trying to be judgy. I'm just saying, <laughs> you, you just need to go out and buy at least one of her books. Oh, you do? They're yeah. very well written and they're funny. They are. She always very witty. adds humor in with the recipes. Yes. And, yeah. They're yeah. well thought out and the pictures are beautiful and the recipes are tried and tested and... And spot on every yeah. single time. Yeah. And they're different. Yeah. You know, they're not, there's, you won't find like every day. I mean, she does have your, and staples and stuff like that. Well, sure. Even in this cookbook. But they're not like, you won't find like everyday recipes in mm-hmm. most of her books. They're a little different. There's always a little twist, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So yeah, run out and get you one. Yep. It's best selling. And she's for a very, best, very good reason. She's a best selling co author of Veganomicon. Which yes, I think is. we already talked about. We already did. We You did do a recipe from Veganomicon. Yeah. Yep. And I'm excited to talk about next week's recipe. 
I'm just going to give you a little hint. Oh my gosh, so excited about it was next week's recipe. It was fantastic. Fabulous. Uh, I made it out of a recent e cookbook that's been released by um, a few of my favorite vegans out there in the world. Uh, just a little taste. But I'll, we'll talk and tell you all about it next week. Oh. Uh. It was fantastic. We, yeah, cooked, we, we cooked we, it tonight. We, well, no, let's not give me any credit for any cooking <laughs> over here. No, 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 no. You I cooked did. this tonight. Yes. And, you know, for those of you who are curious, this we are uh, recording on Valentine's Day. Hey, happy Valentine's hey, Day. Happy Valentine's Day to all. And yes. So, hope you had a great Valentine's Day. Yes, absolutely. A little more love in the world is always a good thing. Um, but yes, so this was the, the meal that I came home to on Valentine's day and it was just a fantastic surprise. Gotta say fabulous recipe expertly executed by my lovely <laughs> wife. <laughs> Why? Thank you. So stay tuned next week to hear all about that recipe because mm-hmm. I'm excited to tell you about it Yeah, Amazing. And, where, and where you can get it. Yes. All right. So let's move on. What are we talking about next? What would you like to talk about next? Are we talking about the fact that vegan meat, which is an oxymoron, but um, vegan meat alternatives are on track to become cheaper than animal-based meats? Yes. Um, Let's talk about that. All right. So according to The Beat, that's the B-E-E-T dot com, um, Vegan meat alternatives are on track to become cheaper than beef by 2023. That's right. That's next next year, year. people. Yeah, not 2040, 2023, which I think is amazing. I that I was shocked actually when I when I saw that. (laughs) You shocked? I was. I was shocked. Shocking. Um, Yes, absolutely. I was shocked Um, because, as I'm sure. Um, any of you know, and by vegan meat alternatives, we're not talking about the standard tofu, tempeh, seitan. No, we're no, we're, we're talking, talking, talking about, about beyond, beyond and impossible, impossible and, and alpha your... foods and all of those yeah. things that are replicating um, ground beef. Specific, I, well, no, not always ground beef. But In most ground beef, instances, chicken nuggets. Yeah. You know, fried fish, right? Those kinds of things. Yeah. So, um, the primary example in the article that we're referencing um, is beef, right? And so, uh, but as I'm sure anyone who has purchased any of these items before is aware, they are more expensive than their traditional counterparts. Um, when it comes to beef specifically, it's about twice as expensive to buy a pound of Beyond or Impossible meat than it is to buy a pound of ground beef. This obviously makes certain vegan foods inaccessible. For a lot of people. For a lot of people. Yeah. That, that, that price differential is prohibitive um, for a lot of folks. And so hearing that these prices may be coming down in the very near future um, as production becomes streamlined and more efficient that there will be product to meet demand at lower prices. Yeah. I mean, that needs to happen. It really does. Um, This study that was done by the organization called Good Food Institute, uh, they conducted this study along with the consumer research firm MindLab, and their study came up with the fact that taste is ranked number one and price is ranked number two. And they concluded that for vegan meat to achieve widespread acceptance uh, and demand, this price parity, it's essential for alternative proteins to make it in the market. So it's going to happen because these companies do these studies for marketing purposes. Yeah. For money-making purposes. Of course. So these companies are finding out now that in order for them to remain on the market – they need to make that price parity has to happen. It has to. Otherwise, they're just going to kind of fade into obscurity because people are going to stop being able to afford them. Well, I don't think it's a matter of them fading into obscurity. I mean, I I think that the consumers that are already purchasing those products, and, and let's just underline here the fact that um, there is 
1,320% more times vegan meat on restaurant menus yeah. than there were since the start of the COVID yeah, pandemic. Yeah, I mean, that's substantial. So that's huge. That's, yeah. that's not 100% more. It's a thousand... A thousand percent. Three hundred twenty percent more. more. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. So I I don't know that the the companies that are producing these meat alternatives have to be too terribly concerned about fading into nothingness. But if they want to increase their market share, and if we want to move towards the goal of attracting more vegans, yeah, you know, a very simply getting fewer getting more people to eat less meat or to eat no meat or any animal products at all, then that price parity is essential. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not discounting the fact that um, vegan meats um, in general have become super popular. Mm -hmm. There's that one pub in Wales that went wholly vegan. Yeah, they were to go there. They were struggling during COVID, they had a couple of vegan nights. They were very successful. Mm-hmm. And the owners decided, let's just go vegan. Yeah. And now they are booked through like the beginning of next year. Wow. Like you can't just, walk, which is really unusual for a small pub type restaurant. Sure. In Wales sure. to be booked into the next year. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you remember the name? Um, I can't, I don't remember the name. It was something like the Queen's Pub or something like that. And do you remember where in Wales? Uh, I don't. Oh, bummer. Okay. So we'll, more we'll research find that. is required. Yeah, we, we'll, yeah. I need to know more about this. We'll, we'll find all those details. I mean, I know those details. I just can't off the top of my head. Can't give them to you right now. Um, but, uh, we'll report back next week. Yes. But uh, they are, they're, they're experiencing such a growth that they don't even know what to do about it. That's really cool. It. Yeah, it's like they've it's something that they've never seen before. And this is a restaurant and pub that has been in business since like 1502. <laughs> I'm not kidding <laughs> you, right? And they're like, "Okay, this is the most successful year we've had since 1502." <laughs> since King Henry came by and we made him a pie. <laughs> We haven't seen crowds like this since Anne Boleyn was beheaded. Seriously, oh, it's been that long. God, really? <laughs> <laughs> I know I had to go there. You did. Yeah. Okay. So what well, else? Hey, at least you got the right century. Oh, yeah, I know. 1500s. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm impressed. I've been around you long enough to, <laughs> to learn a little bit about British history. Fair point. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah. So uh, the meat, uh, the animal meat to vegan meat yes. disparity price-wise. That's going to change. We're going to see that. Yeah, we're going to see that gap According close. to this article, we're going to see that gap close. In the next year. In the next year. That's amazing. Yeah. So that is good news, not only for those of us who do purchase those products from time to time yeah, um, already, but for an entire world of people that may not have been able to investigate them um, up to this point. Yeah, because people might be curious about like buying Beyond or Impossible, but they see that it's twice as much. Yeah. And they're like, eh, I don't think so. I'm right. not even sure I'm going to like it. I'm not going to sp- spend exactly. twice as much money on a pound of vegan meat, you know? Yeah, exactly. So that'll be cool to see. I hope that happens. Um, if not when they said it before. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think, 2023 is a is a great goal and i really hope that we we do see that now of yeah. course and this is going to lead us into our our next article which is up for discussion yeah um but of course the concern being is that with a lowering in price point right there's likely to be higher demand which means that higher companies production. will need to produce more yeah and so how are all of our favorite uh vegan meat producers going to maintain their ethics uh when it comes to uh quality of life for their workers right um and all of that delightful stuff as we know one of uh one of our very well known uh vegan friendly companies uh amy's amy's kitchen yeah um is having some issues there yeah they're uh, still having issues and um to follow up on what we talked about last week 
Food Empowerment Project is now highly recommending that you boycott Amy's Kitchen products, um, that you stand with the workers. Um, they've drafted a letter to their CEO. Um, the workers have demanded a meeting with the CEO and um, Amy's Kitchen uh, as a whole is pretty much taking a union busting stand. They they are giving very limited feedback to their workers uh, right now. And so it's not looking good. So we, we, along with Food Empowerment Project, are recommending that you boycott their products right now. Yes, indeed. Which is sad. Yes. So it is It is sad. It is yeah. sad because we are fans of their products. And, um, you know, it's always a good thing to see a, a brand like this doing well and so of course we would like to see them continue to do well, but we also uh, want to make sure that their their workers are well treated and um, are paid a living wage and have the Absolutely. healthcare and safety precautions that they need. Um, so yes, there is a petition that you can sign, which I have done. Have, right. And did you also? Uh, yep, absolutely. Yep. Okay, so we both signed the petition uh, through the Action Network. Um, So far, uh, 1,175 signatures have been collected on this petition. Uh, Their goal is 1,600, so 425 signatures left to go. Yeah, so if you think about it, um, please go out and sign that petition. If you can't find it, um, go to the Food Empowerment Project website. They have a direct link to the petition that you can sign. Yes, and so we would highly recommend that. Yeah, just so we can um, let the CEO, uh, what's his name, Burbank, uh, Burbanic. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to look at my notes. Um, the CEO, Berliner, Andy Berliner, Andy Berliner. Yes, we want Andy Berliner to know that people are listening, people are watching. We want him to do the right thing. We want Amy's Kitchen to do the right thing by their workers. We want to be able to stand behind his brand. Absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, being vegan, it means that we want things to be ethical. Yeah. You know, and just because a company brands themselves as vegan and vegetarian doesn't necessarily mean that they're being ethical. No. We just want these companies to know that we're watching. Yeah. You know, so sign that petition if you can to let Andy Berliner know, yeah, we're watching. Yep. Absolutely. So join the bo- join the boycott. Yes. Yes. Jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> um, yeah, that's sad because uh, we ate, uh, we had an Amy's Kitchen pizza in our freezer from months and months ago. And we ate that pizza last week. Last week, yeah. And I think I said as we were eating that pizza, this is the last Amy's Kitchen thing yeah. we're going to eat yeah. for a long time until we see some significant change coming yeah. out of their corporation. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's sad. We're, I mean, we're hurt. And I think a lot of people who trust brands like this and then see that they're just, you know, it, it's disheartening. Well, sure it is. I, I mean, I agree. Yes, it is disheartening. But you have to always remember that, okay, yes, we're we're talking about, you know, vegan corporations but they are still corporations right i mean i know they're they're in it to make money right absolutely and so you know we just yeah it's it's just a matter of of us being out here keeping them honest that's right (laughs) (laughs) gotta keep them honest as much as we can anyway yeah Yeah. uh so what else is on our agenda what else do we want to talk about we talked about amy's kitchen we We talked about um the vegan meat alternative vegan meat alternative we also wanted to have a little conversation about honey if i oh yeah there was a great article about honeybees fantastic article yeah uh and because a lot of vegans i mean there is this thing about vegans some vegans are not anti-honey um but it's good to arm yourself with the knowledge when people ask you why you don't eat honey because people uh, kind of marginalize it because bees are insects and right. they don't seem to get as much respect in the animal world as like, you know, fluffy sheep. As, and a, as a cow or a pig or a yeah. chicken. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, talk about that article because it, it's... 
it's I kind of mind blowing because this floored me. And thank you, Food Empowerment Project, for this article. It was really just tremendously enlightening. I learned so much about bees and honey that I did not know before, and so it it just completely cemented my commitment to not using honey. Yeah, um, we have not used or purchased yeah, honey I mean, since we went vegan. We don't but... use honey because, um, you know, the bees are exploited. Yes, they but certainly this, are. But this article on Food Empowerment Project really expounds on that. Tells us very specifically how the bees are exploited. So first of all, um, of course, we all know that bees are natural pollinators and that they uh, they feed off of flowers and other plants and help to... Um, encourage growth in those plants um, as a part of the ecosystem. Bees that are used for the production of commercial they're honey farmed. are farmed. They're farmed. And people often don't call bees farmed animals, but they're farmed animals. Yes. So these are farmed bees and they're not getting their, no matter what your honey says on it, they're not getting their pollen from the wildflowers that are anywhere near their hive. They're actually being given artificial feeds, which are generally sugar syrup or high fructose corn syrup. So check that out. Your honey is actually made out of high fructose corn syrup. Well, I mean, uh, I've read a couple of articles on this. Um, And it depends on how large the production is. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can get honey from a local bee farmer. Mm -hmm. And those bees are getting their pollen from, you know, the local flowers sure. and, and stuff like that. But what they're doing, just in the same way that they do with, like, uh, dairy cows, when the bees produce, um, ch- change the pollen into honey, which is their food source, what they do is they take the honey and then they subtract, or I'm sorry, they don't subtract, they take what you're talking about sugars Mm -hmm. and all that so that the bees can feed the hive. So what they're doing, like what they do with cows, right? So they take the baby cow away from the mother yes, and they give the baby cow formula, right? So that they can take the milk intended for the baby cow and And give it to humans, give it to humans. So they do the same thing with bees. They take the honey away from the bees and the honey should be bee food, right? Which is bee food. And then to make up for the fact that they've taken the bees' food away in order to keep the hive surviving, not Mm -hmm. thriving, but surviving, they supplant that with sugar syrup or high fructose corn syrup. and high fructose corn syrup. Right. Yeah. And actually, the use of high fructose corn syrup has been tied to the collapse of bee colonies around the world because it doesn't contain a specific enzyme um, that helps them to fight off toxins. Toxins and fungal so, and problems. Exactly. And, yeah. So, you know, um, insecticides and fungicides and all of those things. Um, it, the, the, the faux food doesn't have the nutrients that the bees need. Right. To, exactly. To survive. So that's one way. Um, a second way, and this one really blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. We all know that, uh, we'll go back to your dairy industry um, example for a yeah. moment, but we all know that um, milking cows are spend the vast majority of their lives pregnant and their young are taken from them almost instantly yeah. after birth um, so that the milk can be uh, prepared for humans instead of for baby cows who mm-hmm. actually should have the milk. And in order for that to to happen, the cows are artificially inseminated. Where did my brain just go? <laughs> are you talking about artificially inseminating bees? Oh well, yes. yes, I'm going to I'm going to talk about artificially inseminating bees because I I can't even imagine artificially inseminating a a bee. Like it just completely blows my mind. But they do. I, yes, I know. Yeah. And I'm, that's what I'm saying. I have learned this and, you know, mind blown kind of a thing. <laughs> so, yes. But the thing is, not only do they artificially inseminate the bees, but they're inseminated with the semen of multiple mature drones at the same time. But while she's being, I mean, the drones are killed 
in this process. Yeah. Their heads are crushed and their abdomens are squeezed and Yikes. they collect the semen. Yeah, I'm sorry. It just does not sound like a good way to go. It's not pleasant. No, not at all. And then they immobilize the queen and knock her out with carbon dioxide gas. <laughs> right. In order to inseminate her. Yeah. With the semen from about 10 different drones. Yeah. It it's terrible. Like just just the thought of that. Yeah. I'm sorry that it, I had no idea. And yeah. I, I feel just hideous that I didn't know about this. Yeah. And then on top of that, um, Queens will, when they sense a uh, hive collapse, will fly off and form another hive of bees somewhere in the natural world. Yes. If there's hive collapse, if the, if the queen bee just like any other queen, if she discovers that her court has gone awry, she will take flight and find other people to bow down to take a knee to well, her, okay. right? Okay, hang on But a so second. what they do is, <laughs> I know, I, I'm being uh, kind of facetious about it. You are. Just to lighten it a little bit. But what uh, bee farmers do often is they, they pluck the wings off of the queen so she can't do that. They clip her wings. Yeah. yeah. So it, it keeps the it keeps the hive from swarming. Um, and this doesn't only happen, you know, when the queen senses hive collapse, but also when a younger queen is born into the hive, because right. uh the younger queen will then take over that hive. Yeah. And the older queen will swarm she'll, off. She'll step with, down, swarm off yeah, with, she'll with swarm a few off with some with her her court, let's right. say, and uh, start another hive. Yeah. Um, so, but they don't get the opportunity. To but do they that. don't get the opportunity. They don't to get do the that. opportunity to live out their natural their lives as life. they're supposed to yeah. live. Yeah. Their their natural life is d- totally disrupted. Yes. Uh, and okay, so these are just some of the reasons. You know, we didn't eat honey because uh, we knew farming honey exploited another being. Yes. We never really looked this deep into no. the bee farming aspect. And, okay, so this just kind of solidifies our our views on why oh, we don't eat honey. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, without question. This just completely floored me. So, one worker bee, okay, if allowed to live her life as she is meant to, one worker bee will live for about one month and will produce a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her entire lifetime. In that month, she will produce one twelfth of one teaspoon of honey. So that means one teaspoon of honey that you put in your tea right. is the work of 12, twelve bees. Twelve worker bees. Lifetime work yeah. of twelve bees. Yeah. So every time you have a teaspoon of honey, 12 bees lived and died to make right. that honey. Spent their entire Spent their lifetime. their entire lives making yeah. that honey. Yeah. So with so many alternatives to honey available, there are vegan honeys out there. And then, are, of course, you know, we have our agaves and our um, maple syrups yeah. and all yeah. kinds of other things that we can use instead of honey to yeah. sweeten things when necessary. Um let let's stay away from the honey. Yeah, I mean, I understand that honey has a lot of health benefits for humans. It does. Um and uh I appreciate all those health benefits and the fact that probably native people discovered the benefits yes. of honey in a health sense, but they were getting that honey from a hive in a tree. Mm-hmm. Um and not farming the beings, not causing disruptions to their life cycles, right? not clipping their wings, not, not artificially inseminating not them. Not murdering entire yeah. hives after a harvest season. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean... Once again, uh, I hate to say it, but the, the colonization of our planet has, you know, animals have been colonized too. Yeah. You know? And this is just another area where colonization has taken over, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, great. Yes, honey has a million wonderful, positive health benefits mm-hmm. for human beings. But those the benefits of 
that honey do not outweigh the damage that the it damage does. The damage that it's done. No, yeah. it does not. I mean, unless you have your own little hive that you don't do any of these terrible things to, <laughs> that you just live, let them live out their lives in a tree in your yard, and occasionally you steal a little honey from them. Well, no, I don't even think you get to do that. Yeah. Remember, the honey is supposed to be bee food. It is bee food. It's bee food. But the reason that we know that there's um, health benefits from honey is because native people experimented. Yes, you are absolutely right. Yeah. And I'm not saying that everybody should go out and find a swarm of bees in the woods because, hello, number one, that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, I just don't condone you going out and disrupting a, a swarm of bees in a tree. I, yeah, I'm not condoning that. <laughs> I'm just no. saying the reason we know that the that the honey has benefits is because Native people found those benefits, but learn to live in, uh, in in harmony. In with, harmony, yeah, with the bees' life cycles, right? And respecting the bees' life cycles, yeah. and respecting that the honey is also something that the bees need in order to live the lives that they are supposed to live, right? And you know, not just kind of greedily taking it all from them, yeah. You know, um, so yes, it's a it's a question of balance. Absolutely. Um, but the way the vast m- majority of, of honey in this world is produced is is not produced in a way that I would consider to be either ethical or sustainable. I mean, no. here's here's another question. We've we've heard of the terror that is the collapsing bee population globally. Yeah. That, you know, the the lack of honeybees around the world um the declining honeybee populations is a serious problem yeah. um, in just in terms of pollination and growth of crops and all of yeah. that good stuff. Um, so, so why then after a harvest season would you kill hives of bees? Right. Um, and, and there are instances of that, um, that they are intentionally killed um, after uh, a harvest season. Yeah. Sometimes by burning them alive in their hives. Yeah, they set the hives on fire. That's terrible. It's terrible. Well, um, number you know one, what? the honeybee is not a native species. No. To at least where we live. No. Uh, I think to the Americas in general. It's not. It's a, the, the honeybee is yeah. European. There are um, hundreds of other pollinators that can do the job of honeybees. Yes. Um, and I think a little bit, I, I just get this feeling that a little bit of the, um, kind of, you see things about, you know, the collapse of the honeybee population and a little bit of it kind of smacks of propaganda to me that we're all supposed to protect the honeybee to, and I get a little bit of this, um, kind of the same way with the dairy industry that they're kind of trying to get people on the side of the bee farmers. You know what I mean? And we live in a part of the country where um, honeybee farming, it's a business. That We live in grape country. And the bee farmers, will they're hired. They move their hives. And you will see from time to time when you're driving through uh, vineyard country around here, stacks of hives because people have... uh, grapes that need to be pollinated they have uh, fruit trees that need to be pollinated and the bee farmers will move their hives in accordance to where they're hired out and they move them around and move them around if the honeybee is not a native species who was doing that before before the europeans brought you know the honeybee that we know today i mean i don't have an answer to that (laughs) i don't either but I, I guess the point I'm trying to get at is don't always believe everything you're reading about saving. I guess if you see stuff that talks about saving the honeybees, and believe me, I want to save the honeybees too, just as much as the next person does. But uh, consider the source when you see articles about that. Are they promoting bee farming or are they promoting maintaining the species? You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. 
I mean, I think that's a, a good piece of advice for just about anything. Yeah. Is to, you know, do your homework and make sure you know what is actually being asked. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to saving something. Yeah. Yeah. What's the actual context? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one other little thing I wanted to touch on. Um, we just had the Super Bowl yesterday. We did. We don't watch the Super Bowl. We did not. But last night when I was laying in bed, I, I was just curious to see what was happening on the Super Bowl. So I looked on my phone because you can watch live online. Okay. And it was like I think late in the third quarter or something. And I wanted to see who was winning the game. Mm -hmm. And they happened to focus in on the owner of the Cincinnati Bengals. And he was wearing a ball cap that said something farms. I'm like, mm, that's interesting. And then the announcers, which I was just about ready to, I didn't even have the sound on. I had the closed captioning on. Uh -huh. And I was just about to get rid of the closed captioning when the announcers were saying something about he was promoting a dairy farm. Okay. And I'm like, that's bizarre. Is the dairy industry that desperate that they're making the owner of a, a pro football team wear a hat with the name of their farm in order to promote dairy. I mean, you know, people pay billions of dollars for a commercial during the Super Bowl. Right? Yes. How much did they pay that guy to wear that hat? Is what I'm saying. Well, I, I have no idea. I mean, it, couldn't it just have been a completely random thing that he happened to be wearing that hat? Um, I don't think it was random because the announcers were talking about him um, supporting and promoting this dairy farm. Anyway, I don't, it, I, it don't needs, I don't I, have I enough need, context on this I don't story. Either. I have to look into that further. If anybody out there has any more information on that, I'm like, what? Did I just tune into the Super Bowl at just the right time where they're talking about the Super Bowl is promoting the dairy industry? <laughs> like, oh, no. Yeah, more research. And is I required. was rooting for the Cincinnati Bengals, and they lost. By the way, if you mm -hmm. don't know, sorry. Uh, spoiler alert: if you haven't watched the game, <laughs> given that I didn't even know who was playing, you know, you I go. didn't really either. But it was the Cincinnati Bengals and the Los Angeles Rams, and I just happened to catch that, and I saw on that guy's hat that he had some farm on his hat, and just as my mind was like, "That's interesting. Why is he wearing a hat that says something farms?" And then the the color guys were talking about him promoting dairy farming. Anyway, I have to look more into that. And if anybody yeah. else knows anything, let me know. Okay. 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 What, do you, what else do you want to talk about? Well, I, I think that was pretty much it. You did say that you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a little publishing house that you're fond oh. of. Oh, Lantern Publishing. Hey, I wanted to tell everybody. If you're looking for good books on veganism and, I mean, anything in the vein of, like, living ethically and all that stuff. Social justice. Yeah, social justice and all this. Um, if you're looking for good books, check out Lantern Publishing and Media Company. Um, I follow them on Instagram. They publish books on uh, animal advocacy, humane education, religion, psychology and family therapy, social justice, veganism and you can purchase ebooks from their website at lanternpm.org and they also hold these really cool virtual conferences that you can log into and you can get all the information on their website i just i just wanted to shout them out um we're not like sponsored by them or anything no not at all um i just like to shout out companies that are kind of furthering the education in yeah. in those fields, right? Yep. So they're publishing books by authors that would probably be self-publishing if they hadn't found Lantern. They're small authors. Um, not this, you know, there are no small authors. There are only small parts. <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, that, that's actors, <laughs> not I, authors. I know. I'm being facetious. Okay. Gotcha. I'm just saying, not that these authors are small. I'm just saying that they. This is a. It's kind of a niche. It's, it, yes, publishing it is. It's a. It's a company. It's a niche market. And I really appreciate all the work that they do and and the authors that they publish because there's a lot of really good information out there. Mm -hmm. 
So check them out. Like I said, it's Lantern Publishing and Media, and you can find them on Facebook and Instagram and check out their website. Yes, and they are super cool. I can definitely tell you that two of the titles that they are uh, currently selling um, are pretty darn fantastic. And yeah. those are, of course, Confessions of an Animal Rights Terrorist by yeah. Karen Levinson and Peace to All Beings, Veggie Soup for the Chicken Soul, which was by Judy Carmen. Yeah. Um, and those are the two audiobooks that I have had the pleasure and privilege of narrating. Uh, Confessions of an Animal Rights Terrorist is readily available uh, through Audible or Amazon. And... Uh, Peace to all beings will be coming soon. Yeah. Very soon. We're very, very close to the end on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Very close to the end. Yeah. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to, I don't mean to sound like I'm selling something because I'm really not. I just want to let people know that if you're looking for information on these subjects, that Lantern has a lot of really great titles uh, that you can check out and really great authors that are providing us with some fantastic reading absolutely so like i said not uh, sponsoring us or anything just check them out yep just trying to give heads up to where heads up is due absolutely just we, we're just pointing in directions <laughs> okay i'm gonna wrap things up because it's uh starting to sound like we're gonna ramble and um no <laughs> impossible i don't want to ramble and my stomach is making noises and i apologize if my stomach making noises has come up oh, Oh, we'll see in editing if you can hear it. I'll try and edit it out. Um, but uh, this is what happens when we podcast too soon to dinner time. All right. Uh, I'll do a little housekeeping. You can email us any questions, comments, or complaints at uh, compassionandcucumbers at gmail.com. Please, please donate to our fundraiser that we are holding for Mockingbird Farms Animal Sanctuary. They have just recently taken in a new rescue, uh, Cece, who is currently at Cornell Animal Hospital. Uh, she's a little calf um, mm. who who was taken uh, from a pretty bad situation, and she's struggling right now. She has pneumonia and a couple of other things going on. They could really use uh, the extra money right now because oh, the baby. medical bills are piling up. Um, so please donate to them either directly through their website. That's Mockingbird Farms Animal Sanctuary or through our buy me a cup of cup, not a cup, not a cup. No, buy me a coffee. Yeah, it's buy me a coffee dot com backslash cucumbers. And we're still doing the hey, our first fifty dollar donor. Who has not stood up yet? No, will receive. Will receive a, a limited edition Compassion and Cucumbers T-shirt and and a free copy of the audiobook of Confessions of an Animal Rights Terrorist by Karen Levinson. Yes, and I'm I'm really just going to start throwing more and more gifts onto that. <laughs> we could. <laughs> I'm going to dig through my drawers. I'm going to find. No, we we've we've got we've we've got some stuff stashed yeah. away that you know stickers, we've buttons, been, whatever I can find. Yeah. We've got some stuff stashed away that we're willing to give out. So if we yeah. need to keep sweetening the pot, we will keep yeah. sweetening Look, the pot. If I have to give you fifty dollars to give us fifty dollars, I will do that. So <laughs> reach out, reach out to our I fundraiser. Think that kind of defeats the point. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. But I'll good, give you a hundred dollars to give but, us fifty. You know, but good try, well played. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, buymeacoffee.com backslash cucumbers. And donate to the Mockingbird Animal Farm Sanctuary. Mockingbird Farms Animal Sanctuary. What wow, did you my, just say? I said Mockingbird Animal Farm Sanctuary. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. nice. Ooh, my dyslexia just kicked in really hard there. Yeah, big time. All right. So I, I guess that's it. We're going to wrap things up. We will see you next week. We will talk about a new recipe, which I am so excited, excited to about. tell you about. Oh, my gosh. Yep. So we'll see you next Tuesday. I hope you have a great week. And thank you so much for listening Thanks, everyone. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. If you'd like to support the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com backslash cucumbers and buy us a cup of coffee. Thanks so much for listening and for supporting us in what we're doing. We're really having a good time with it. <laughs>